Reuben in last Sunday made a reference to, uh, you know, the end times. I think we all have different concepts of what that means. And I remember when I became a Christian back, like, late 77 or whatever, it was through Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And then they had these classes you could go to at night. You know, they had new believers classes and walk through the Bible and... and um, class on the Holy Spirit, whatever, you know, it was all this different stuff. And I, um, it seemed like end times was uh, really a big issue. And I don't know if I took a particular class on or if it was just part of the ones that I took, but, um, you know, it, it was Maranatha and the whole thing. Chuck would, had prophecy conferences all the time and it seems to have waned a little bit. I, I know Jack Hibbs and David Hawking are often putting on prophecy conferences and stuff, but I had a hard time back in those times because I, I knew, you know, reading in the scriptures and reading Revelation and, and going to some of these conferences, some of the things they were saying um, that denoted what the end times were, and it was like, other than Israel becoming a nation again, I just didn't see some of these things happening. You know, especially the prophecies concerning Israel and how they were going to be attacked by all these different countries and how um, there wasn't going to be anybody to help them but God. And I'm thinking, well, the United States, we're like the best ally they've got and we're big and powerful and they're on pretty good terms with a lot of the countries around them. I just didn't see the, that kind of stuff happening. And I think, you know, maybe a lot of people felt that way. It's just, well, maybe we're not that close after all. But I'd have to say within this last six years, um, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> As when he brought that up last Sunday, I'm thinking, yeah, what exactly? I need to go back and look at this, you know, Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and, and Revelation and Matthew, and because I really think we're getting close. Things, things are starting to shape up as I was taught years ago about what the end times are going to look like. And now I'm seeing rising anti-Semitism. I'm seeing some of these other things I'll touch on briefly, but it's... Um, It's pretty interesting. I, I, I remember reading in Acts, you know, what the first century church was going through. And I used to think, man, what scary times. But it would have been a really interesting time to live. But, and now I'm thinking, wow, you know, so we may be living in the book of Revelations. <laughs> we may be living in the end times. I mean, those people, you know, we read what they went through in the, in the, the beginning, and then we may be the people living at the end. But anyway, so actually, um, as I started looking into it, I said, well, you know, the men's prayer breakfast, uh, this is a kind of topic that, that they do whole weekend conferences on. <laughs> and so I'm not going to get through uh, the whole thing in, in one men's breakfast. And you're all going, thank you. Um, so... I wanted to start, though, with that prophecy in Daniel, uh, Daniel's 70 weeks, and just take it up to about where the rapture is without getting into too much detail, but kind of go through some of the scriptures that we read that cover this period of time. And then maybe, uh, like on my notes, I have Daniel 70 weeks part one, um, so after, so May and June, when we get back, we can review this a little bit and then go into some more detail uh, from the rapture through the, uh, the tribulation and some of the uh, prophecies uh, related to that. And I'd like current events. I think it would be really good for you guys to, I don't know how many here are, I'm almost a, kind of a news addict. I'm always logging on to Fox News and checking stuff out. And CNN, I go to CNN. I, I don't bother with MSNBC. 
But, I mean, some other good sources, um, sometimes like BBC News, not the United States one, but the one, the real BBC News in England, uh, Jerusalem Post, um, you get a little better coverage of stuff that's going on in the world, a little more of the truth. Um, and I focus your eyes on what's going on in the Middle East, but also around the world too. But um, I pretty much had it with uh, Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears and I don't know about you guys, but I was so fed up with Michael Jackson. I was like, you couldn't even put, you could not bring up, and Fox News, come on, really? Every day, Michael Jackson is Michael Jackson, that picture of Michael Jackson, and then Lindsay Lohan. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's just distraction. The real news is what's going on in the Middle East, because that's where it's all going to start taking place. Anyway, um, Moses, if you could just put the, picture up there as well um, so in Daniel if we go to Daniel 20 or Daniel I'm sorry first let's go to Daniel 2 uh, so it's hmm? yeah Daniel's after Isaiah and Ezekiel and Yeah, it's Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now it's a big section, so we're not going to read the whole thing, but I want to kind of set the stage here. So Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he wants people to interpret, but he's tired of these his uh, soothsayers and stuff. Uh, he wants to make sure that they really know what they're talking about. So he says, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. I want you to tell me what the dream was and then give me the interpretation. Well, <laughs> that's pretty, putting a, uh, a high standard of, of proof on them. So, of course, they couldn't do this, but then a, Daniel comes forward. Someone remembers Daniel has him come forward and talk about that. Now the beast, or the, the vision that he had was of this guy over here. Wow, he's not going to show up on that, is he? He won't go on there. Ah. That's interesting. How about that? Put that away. But anyway, the horizontal guy down there, um, that was his vision. So... In verse 31, he says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, the great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. Well, this guy's laying down before you. Um, and his form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in, in the process, in the pieces. I mean. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, he had to be pretty impressed this time already. He says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. For, God, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field, or in the birds of the heavens. He has given them unto your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold, but after you shall rise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be 
as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything and like iron has that crushes the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron the kingdom shall be divided yet the strength of the iron shall be in it as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile and you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay they will mingle in the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay and in the day of the kings the god of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall be shall not be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume the kingdoms and it shall stand forever inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out from the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron the bronze the clay the silver and the gold the great god has made known to the king that he will that will come to pass after this the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure so this is uh, uh monday night we i mentioned that you know i had read the late great late great planet earth and back when i was in college and i was not a christian then and somebody gave me this book and i read that and the thing that impressed me about its argument was that hal lindsey when he wrote that was that the prophecies of the old testament were very specific and they always came true 100 percent so um this is an example of one of those prophecies that's pretty incredibly specific. And so what we see is when he says that we're talking about the head of gold and that Nebuchadnezzar was that kingdom, that was the Babylonian kingdom. And then as we look, the chest of silver was the Persian empire that came after that, Cyrus. And then after that, you have the, the Greeks with Alexander the Great um, conquering the world. And then after that, the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire um, divided after that. And his image here, he shows the Eastern Division was the, like the Greek Orthodox Church because the, the Roman Catholic Church came out of that. But there was the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Orthodox, or the Roman Church, Papal Church. But then in Daniel 9, Daniel receives this vision. that concerns the rest of history. So he gives a brief history through this image that that Nebuchadnezzar saw. But then he's going to talk more specifically about our the future going on. Now he says that this image goes on to the end to where the the rock that's hewn out that's Christ it destroys all these other kingdoms and then uh, you know, reigns in the millennium at the end. But he's going to go into more detail here, some very, very specific things. And if you remember, I don't know uh, how much you guys are into history, but um, the Babylonians uh, were conquered. But you have to remember that, like, the Babylonians were before the time of Daniel, they'd been going on for quite some time. And I think, um, if you remember, uh, no, in the, just left me, um, Jonah, supposed to go and, and witness to the Babylonians. They'd been around a long time, but it was when um, he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, and they took the Jews into captivity, 
And then the Persians came along. Well, the Persians had been along a long time too, but they didn't really rise to power as become a world power until they conquered the Babylonians. Um, and the Greeks had been around too because the Persians and the Babylonians were, or the Persians and the Greeks were battling each other. And you probably remember the uh, Thermopylae, uh, the Spartans, the 300 that held off the Persian army. The, the Greeks knew that the Persians were coming to, uh, to capture, to take them as part of their kingdom and the Greeks. The Greeks were funny. The Greeks had uh, all these city-states. It wasn't like the country of Greece. It was just in this whole area uh, where Greece is, they had all these different city-states, and Athens is one of the bigger ones. So it wasn't as easy, it wasn't that easy for the Greeks to just say, send the army out, you know. They had to go and start negotiating with all these other city-states. And in the book Herodotus, it gets into some detail about that, and that's pretty pretty funny because, you know, they go out and they say, okay, well, you know, we've got so-and-so and he's going to lead the army. And this guy says, well, we're not getting in the war unless my guy leads the army. And they go, well, okay, we'll let him lead the army, but uh, we're going to lead the Navy. Well, I'm not getting involved unless somebody else leads the Navy, you know. And it's like they go through all these negotiations and you're thinking, come on, guys, the Persians are on the way. Let's get it together, you know. And you know, like in the in the case of this particular encounter the the Spartans were like, okay, well, we'll go up there and we'll try and hold them off till you guys get your stuff together, you know. So um, Leonidas takes the, takes the Spartans up there and, and manages to delay them, um, just the 300 of them. But it was a strategic, um, tactical victory on their part because he picked the choke point where they had to come through. It was like... Um, when you read about this army coming from the Persians, where they they drink up rivers, there's so many of them, and the land is left barren after they go through. And the one uh, the isthmus, or the point where they have to pass over from Persia into like the Greek area, uh, they built a bridge, and it took seven days for the army to get across this bridge. You know, it's like there's a lot of guys. Um, so. There was Leonidas and his 300 that stood there in the gap and delayed them long enough for the rest of the Greeks to get together. It's an amazing battle, big, and some providence, I think, maybe of God because there was a big storm that wiped out a big portion of the Greek or the Persian navy uh, with the triremes. You know the big boats you always see the pictures of with the sails, but they have the row, rowing. You ever watch Ben-Hur? My favorite line in that is when Ben-Hur was a slave and he was on one of those triremes and that commander comes down there about to go into battle and he goes, row well and live. <laughs> it's because they were chained. The boat goes down, you go down. Um, but anyway, so then the Persians go at it again with the Greeks, you know, the Battle of Marathon where Fippa, Phippidippides was the guy that ran all the way from Marathon down to Athens saying, you know, victory, victory, we've won them. Because they weren't expecting to win that one. Um, so, and that's where we get our the race, the marathons now. Everybody runs a marathon because this guy ran 26 miles or something. Um, but anyway, so there's kind of this ebb and flow and these, but it's when we're talking about here is when these actually are like considered a world power. Because even after the, the Greeks took over and then the Romans took over, there was still a Persia, Persian empire, but it wasn't a world power anymore. And the Romans and the Persians were always fighting um, on the frontier between them for a long time into the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. So, but what's Daniel talking about here? Daniel gets a vision that kind of lays out the whole rest of world history and beyond. And so in verse 20, well, let's start with 24. Chapter 9, verse 24. Um, 
He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people. Actually, it's not he, Daniel, but I think this is, was it Gabriel talking to him? 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now remember, he's in captivity in Babylon. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness. Okay, those are not properties of any period in history that we know of. So he's talking about something way in the future, like maybe the millennium or the eventual kingdom of heaven. To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Okay, now, again, we're in the head, okay, of gold. He's in Babylon. The Persians haven't even taken Babylon yet. So we're talking um, late, uh, probably late 4th century or uh, the 400s with that 5th century B.C. Um, So it's not until Cyrus, the king of Persia, that they get the word to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So this is before all of that by a couple hundred years, 150 years maybe. So... Now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks. The street, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood and still the end of the war. Desolation and de- Desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Okay, so 70 weeks. Now, the weeks are seven-year periods. So he's saying there's going to be 70 weeks. But first he says, since they're still in Babylon... He's saying, to restore and build Jerusalem, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So the seven weeks, seven times seven is 49, so 49 years to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So it's 49 years until they're going to get the order. I'm sorry, I said 150, but it's 49 years before they get the order to go back. And this is under Persia. So Persia is about to, you get the end of Daniel, that's when the Persians come in and take Babylon. So he's saying seven weeks to that. And then the 62 weeks takes us up to where last Sunday, where Pastor Ruben was teaching about Jesus coming in, or actually the, the, Palm, uh, fr- the Friday, or Palm Sunday, where they, he rode in on the donkey. So Nehemiah is where we get, he gets the order to go back. And that's been dated to uh, March 14, 445 B.C. Then, in April 6 of 32 A.D. is when Jesus rode in on the donkey. And that works out to 1,000, uh, let's see, 173,880 days, which is 62 times 7. So you can't get any more specific than that, Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's when Jesus comes in and it says and then after the 62 weeks the Messiah shall be cut off and he was but not for himself it's for our sins and the people of the prince 
who is to come shall destroy the city. Now he's talking about the prince, um, which is in is also in Revelation is a uh, reference to the Antichrist. Okay, so he's talking about the one who's going to come, but he's talking here the Roman Empire shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So in uh, A.D. 70 is when the Romans came in and destroyed uh, Jerusalem, tore down the sanctuary, and not one stone was left on another, I believe. And that was probably because they put gold in and around. <laughs> so they were melting all the gold off and tearing it down. Um, the end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, now that one week. So we had seven weeks, 62 weeks. So that's 69 weeks altogether, right? So now there's one week left. So now he's talking about this prince or antichrist is going to make a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, that one week we know is the tribulation, in the middle of the week starts the great tribulation. Uh, he says, but in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, we can deduce certain things from what we're reading here sacrifice and offering the jews weren't doing aren't doing sacrifice and offerings now in israel because why what are they missing temple Temple. there's no temple well this implies that there's going to be a temple and the sacrifices are going to be started up again so we can assume that at some point uh within the first half of that seven-year period, and maybe a little before, maybe they'll start building it before. Uh, I mean, if, if we're standing around and we, and, or you're on the Internet and go on to Jerusalem Post and it says, uh, the Jews are going to start building the temple again. Whoa. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you to to throw on sackcloth and, throw ashes on you and go up into Big Bear and wait for him to return. But, I mean, it's close. <laughs> it's going to be close. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so they're going to have the sacrifices will be going. The temple will have been built. Um, and that's always been, you know, in these prophecy conferences they talk about because the Dome of the Rock Mosque that's in Jerusalem is somewhere located, I don't know if it's in the court of the Gentiles of the original temple. They used to think it was actually on the temple site, but I think it's um, more towards the outer court. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was... But anyway, that's a point of contention. So for them to build the temple, that Dome of the Rock Mosque is... When you see pictures of Jerusalem, you see that building with the big gold dome... That's the Dome of the Rock Mosque. Um, something crazy's got to happen for them to be able to build a temple there. So that'll be interesting. That's something to keep in your mind as you're reading news. Is anything happening on the Temple Mount? Um, but anyway, and then in, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So that last half of the tribulation, which we'll get into detail, you know, next time, um, is when the the, uh, the seals are opened and the trumpet judgments, the vials, and God starts judging. But then there's stuff that's happening with the Antichrist and the world powers and the big battle that takes place and So anyway, so here you have in this verses 24 to 27, the rest of world history laid out for us. And you can probably understand why throughout history, like World War I comes and everybody goes, ah, it's the end times, it's the end of the world, a giant world war. And yeah, it kind of fits some of the 
But Israel wasn't a nation at that time. And there was no temple sacrifices going on. It wasn't, it wasn't about Israel at all. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, Put and Cush and Magog and all coming, you know, to battle, is, to take Israel. So it didn't really fit. World War II comes. There were people that were saying that this was the end times because uh, it was World War II. But still, Israel didn't, hadn't become a nation again. Or, yeah, again. So that didn't really fit. So in uh, 1948, when Israel did become a nation again, um, then serious students of prophecy, biblical prophecy, uh, begin to take notice that we may really be in that final generation that, that gets to witness um, the return of Christ or the rapture. We'll be coming back with Christ in the second coming, but the rapture. Now, if you'll notice that on on um, Clarence's diagram, and by the way, um, I got this diagram because I went, I don't know if you guys know about the Blue Letter Bible. It's a website, and it's uh, it's pretty cool because you, uh, you can go on there, and it's got the Bible. You can do all kinds of lookups, and you find a verse, and then it'll say tools, and you click on tools and it gives you all these references dictionaries you click on that and you can go and look stuff up and they have a section with maps and illustrations i went to and i saw one of this guy's drawings uh was different than this one but this clarence larkin and i tried to print it off but it, off that website it didn't print very well so then i went i thought well maybe he's on some other website so i just typed in clarence larkin and i got a website with just his stuff on it. So he's got several of these kinds of illustrations, if you're interested in that. And I may bring in, uh, yes, I'm concerning the tribulation and stuff, so I might bring that in. But on this, you notice he doesn't mention the rapture. And that's because he's talking about Daniel's vision. Daniel doesn't mention a rapture. Okay. So it's not that he's... Uh, um, made a mistake or anything there. It's just he's just dealing with what this is all about. And actually, I hadn't read the small print over there, so I don't know, maybe he does mention it, but it's not, the line's not labeled or anything. So, anyway, so there's the 70 weeks. But So we know what happened in the seven weeks, and we're pretty sure what's happened We've in the Old Testament or whatever. We know what's gone on in the 62 weeks. Christ came Palm Sunday, and now we're in the this gap because between the 69 week and the 70th week, there's a gap, and that's the church age. So this is when the Spirit poured out upon the church when Christ died, Book of Acts. The church starts. So now there's this gap between that 69th week and then the rapture and the start of the 70th week. So during this time, um, there's an interesting set of parables which kind of describes the time that we're in. If you go to Matthew 13, um, That chapter is a set of parables. And it's kind of interesting. There's, uh, what, seven, eight parables where Jesus is basically saying, describing the characteristics of this church age. And we're all familiar with all these. I'm sure all of us have read these before. And I. Frankly, I I know I've read through chapter 13 several times and it never really clicked exactly how this fit in to everything. I don't know. I, um, and it, I, it wasn't until I started looking into all of this and reviewing it that it came up in something that I had read. And I thought, oh, I get that. 
I see Jesus is describing the church age and what's going on during that time and then uh, even beyond. So here we see the, the sower, okay, the sower of the seeds. Some goes on rocky ground, you know, it doesn't root. Some of it goes on to, um, well, let's read, let's read one. Let's read that one. In verse 3, he spoke many things to them in parables. Now, he tells, tells the disciples why he speaks in parables, because the fulfill a prophecy, because the people's hearts were hardened, and they didn't want to hear, and they didn't want to, they were focused on a conquering Messiah. They didn't want to hear about a, a you know, a, a suffering Messiah, and they, they were pretty sold into their, the religion that they have turned um, Judaism into. And so he spoke in parables because they weren't to hear. They weren't to understand. He didn't want them to know. And, but it was given to the disciples to know. And parables are kind of allegorical. Or in the Greek, they had their fables. Okay, Fables were uh, stories that they told to express some kind of uh, uh, examples of good character or certain qualities like uh, was it Androcles and the lion uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, <laughs> Bullwinkle and Rocky cartoon shows that that TV series they always had Aesop's fables where they did this cartoon version of one of the fables but Aesop wrote these uh, fables and one of Androcles and the lion uh, Androcles walking along and he sees this lion and this lion's and they're licking its paw, and it looks at him, and he starts to run. Then he turns back, and he knows the lion isn't chasing him. And he looks, and the lion just keeps licking his paw and licking his paw. So he goes up to the lion, and the lion extends his paw out. So he's like, oh, and you notice he has this big old thorn in there. So he very carefully approaches the lion, pulls that out, treats it, bandages it, and then... Eventually, the lion is able to walk, and it leads him back to its cave. And it goes, and it it'll go out hunt and bring meat to him. And you know, he cook, they eat, and fine. But then some king captures him and the lion, makes him a slave, puts the lion in wherever they keep their lions that they use for killing people. So then, at one point, the Androcles gets a death sentence, and he's thrown into the arena. And the lion that he had pulled the thorn out, they had been starving him so that when he went into that arena, he was going to be hungry. They released the lion, and, you know, Androcles looks at the lion, and the lion's like, they knew each other. And the lion went over, and they just kind of embraced each other, and, and it touched the king so much that he, he released him. And then the whole the thing, the, the point of that was, um, men of noble character recognize gratitude. So that was the point of that fable. So in the Bible, we have parables, parables that are not necessarily a true story, but it's to prove a point. So here we have uh, Jesus starting off this series of parables. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed. Um, and some seed fell by the wayside and the birds and devoured them. Some fell in stony earth, and they immediately sprang up, but because they had no depth of earth, um, oh, sorry, they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. So what he's saying here is that now the gospel is going to go out. The good news is going to go out. And, and we get it. I mean, we read this, but in the whole context of this chapter, he's talking about how the gospel is going to go forth. But because of the folly of men and various reasons, not all are going to accept it. But those that do, 
it's going to grow. It's going to spread. It's going to bring forth. Like, you know, in the, what is it in Proverbs or, or where it says that uh, God's word does not return void. Uh, so it's going to produce. Okay. It's going to spread. The word's going to spread. Then in there's two others in here, the tares and the dragnet. So in the tares, the guy sows a field, but his enemies come in and throw in the bad seed, these tares. The tares look a lot like wheat, and they intermingle. And you can't pull the tares out without pulling out the wheat. So he, his servants come, what do you want us to do? Should we go try and pull that stuff out? And he's going, oh, no, just let it all grow. And then in the end, we'll take it into the threshing floor, we'll separate the tares from the wheat, and we'll burn the tares. Okay, this speaks of what? That, yeah, in this church age, there's going to be good, there's going to be evil. It's going to be so intermingled, but in the end, God's going to separate it out. And the same thing with the, the fishes, or the dragnet. They pull in a net, and they have to, some of the fish they keep, some of the fish they throw out. It gets destroyed. And then in the mustard seed and the leaven are examples of the church and how it will start out small and grow quite large. And then in the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, I like what Matthew Henry said. and He says, here are two parables intended to show that those who expect salvation by the gospel must be willing to venture all and quit all in the, in the prospect of it and that they shall be no losers by the bargain. That the treasure hid in the field and that of the pearl of great price. So for that treasure that's laid before us, we should be willing to venture all, quit all, and know that we will not be the losers by the bargain for what we're going to gain. And then the the final uh, parable, the householder Disciples were to use what Jesus had given them to benefit others. And teach not that the new, teach not the new at the expense of the old, but in light of the old. And and Jesus said, I didn't come away to do away with the old covenant. Right? That's all going to stay. But this is, he was there. He fulfilled all that. And now we have life through him. So, That is all right there, kind of gives you this middle section here. He says the gap between the 69 and the 50, if you might maybe write in there, Matthew 13, the parables. Um, So this is where we are now. But where we are along that line, (laughs) that's that's a good question. Um, like I said, I'm tending to think we're getting real close to that that line just before there. Um, but then if we go over to Matthew 24, um, we're going to get a little idea of what we should be expecting as we get towards the end of this period and what things are going to be, what kind of characteristics are going to, we're going to have. So Matthew 24, uh, let's see, let me go back to... Verse 36, let's see, where is that actually? I didn't write down the actual. Where they asked him, the disciples asked him, 
Well, I don't want to read through this whole thing. But what do we, most of you have read this and most of you know what it's about. The disciples are asking him about the end times, the period towards the end of the gospel kingdom. Verse 4, okay. Oh, yeah. So in verse 4, oh, yeah, the tribulation. But you get these warnings. It says that Jesus answered, I can't help it, I got it. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but in the end is the end is not yet. For nation will be against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, various places in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows, and they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another, and many false prophets will rise up, deceive many uh, because lawlessness lawlessness will abound love for many will grow cold but he who endures to the end shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as in as a witness so what are the char- what characterizes this period of time is that you know you have false christs wars rumors of wars Famines, pestilence, earthquakes, martyrs. I mean, look at the Christians that are being martyred around the world today. That's one of the things, you know, when you read about um, in Revelation about the the beheadings. Was it talk about the saints that are under that table in heaven that were the martyrs who had been beheaded? And I, I used to think, well, who does beheading anymore? I mean, that really hasn't gone on since the French Revolution. <laughs> and uh, they can't be talking about those guys because they were all atheists. So these weren't martyrs for the cause. So, um, But now look what's happening. Beheadings are going on. I mean, it's like back to the 13th century or something here. So pestilence, famines. Wars and rumors of wars. I mean, they're everywhere. There's wars going on everywhere. Earthquakes, tsunamis, earthquakes and tsunamis. But I think it'll get more intense than what we've been experiencing. Um, False prophets, lawlessness. Uh, Look what's happening in this country with with the efforts that being made in our country to get God out of every aspect of our um, society, our government, our military, the lawlessness is starting to just go crazy. I think it was Winston Churchill that said that you can tell the strength of a nation by whether it's women can walk safely down the street at night. Yeah. Maybe if they have a concealed carry permit here. Um, the gospel preached in throughout the world. That's the one positive thing that we'll see in this is that the gospel will have been preached around the world. And we're pretty darn close to that, if not already. Also, we see in if in Second Peter. Uh, chapters 2 and 3, it talks about a growing apostasy among the unsaved within the church, seen in four categories. Denial of the person and deity of Jesus Christ, denial of the work of Christ on the cross, moral apostasy. A lot of churches are saying, hey, it's okay to be homosexual. It's okay for homosexual marriage. It's okay. You know, abortion, well, you know. So, we're talking about Christians within the church. So when they go into tribulation, the rapture happens, the Christians 
go up. But there are the Christians that buy into all of this that will be going through the tribulation. I always like that one. Uh, where did I see that? It was like a, it was a joke thing that was a newspaper headline go, uh, Wrap our uh, thousand uh, millions of Christians disappear around the world. World Council of Churches meets tomorrow to determine what happened. <laughs> so I don't know. You don't hear much about the World Council of Churches anymore, but are they even still? Yeah, it's this ecumenical group of all these churches to get together, and it's it's basically. Uh, well, that has very little to do with Christianity, but um, anyway, so moral apostasy uh, and denying doctrines of the second coming and related judgments. So this is the kind of things that we see as we're coming up towards the end. Um, now, in those parables back in 13, I, I wanted to mention is that Jesus starts a lot of them by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And I, that always used to kind of throw me, but uh, you know Matthew Henry referred to it as the gospel kingdom. Kingdom, that period between the two, the 69th and 70th week, or the church age, but he referred to it as the gospel kingdom. And there is um, when Jesus references that, that's what he's referring to. Um, so the rapture at the end of the kingdom is the removal of the church. And there's no date given in Scripture. And the dead first, then the living are caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 16. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. In 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one through 52 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's a good verse to put up in the nursery. Um, in a moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This rapture sets the stage of the events leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his millennial reign. So, that's as far as I want to go with this, but I think next time we'll pick up again with this rapture and maybe put some... Uh, practical things to it, maybe some specific articles, world events, uh, things that, that I pick up and see if if we agree that maybe we are near this end that's coming and then get into some of the specifics of the tribulation, the Antichrist and the, the judgments that God will bring in the end in the millennial reign. And uh, there's, I got two months, right? I'm going to need it because there's a, a lot of scriptures in Ezekiel and Jeremiah and stuff concerning the millennium. And and now, there are very um, varied ideas about this. And I, I don't know, I'm not going to go into pre-millennial, post-millennial, all-millennial, and all these different theories. Um I'm just going to stick with pretty much what we teach here in Calvary. Um, But maybe that's a study sometime later if you're interested. But there are varying views as to when the rapture occurs and blah, blah, blah. So um, some make good arguments, some not so good. Um, But anytime the Bible leaves something open by not providing a date, then, man, people jump in. Who's that guy? He just died, I think, recently. Came out of, yeah, yeah, 
88 reasons why it's going to happen in 1988 and, and so on and so forth. Um, so whenever there's an opening like that, you know, people jump in and try and fill that gap. But if it, the Bible's silent on it, then, you know, we just have to say, you know, I guess it's kind of like that verse, although it may be taken a little out of context. We can know the, the seasons. We can't necessarily know the hour, but we can know the seasons. We can, if we're vigilant, if we're watching, if we're aware, then I don't think we're going to get caught by surprise. So that's what we need to be doing. That is not our focus, though, even yet. And until he comes, we're to be about the work that we're called to do, and that is to continue spreading the gospel and sharing with people 